everybody, and welcome to this live spoiler review for Avatar The Way of Water, brought to you by the... Geek Buddies! <gasps> hey! hey! Yeah. We're going to have oh, some fun yeah. here. Breaking... Oh, oh, yeah, you have a little faith so in the fun. chat. We're good. Yeah. We're coming. Don't worry. We're coming. <laughs> yeah, worried about yeah, us we... in the chat. Don't you worry about it. We had to figure some things out here first before we jumped on. But yeah, we are ready to go here to talk about this three hour and 12 minute movie, Avatar The Way of Water, the sequel to 2009's Avatar, which Michael Vogel is a bigger fan of than uh, Shannon McClung and I. But we shall see by the end of this review of all three of us are on the same page with this sequel and where it's going, because certainly it was an expansive sequel. A lot of new people involved here, new actors coming into the uh, uh, forefront here, new uh, lands, new tribes, um, some of the same old stuff in terms of uh, the battles and the humans being bad, but some interesting changes and some new approaches to this story and also some groundwork being laid for these future installments that we know are coming and that Cameron has spoken about. So we're going to get into all of that here tonight, but first let's introduce ourselves. I'm the outlaw, John Ruga, writer, producer, and host here on the Geek Buddies and the Outlaw Nation. I'm Michael Vogel. I'm a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm a television actor and an animation writer where you can see some of our current work currently on Netflix with Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City, season two. That's right. Sometimes I think you say Barry White in the Big City, and I kind of want to see that four-minute animated series. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down to see Barry White in the Big City. Anyway. I'm, uh, and subtly, of course I'm subtly taking notes right now. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we are powered and sponsored by the good folks at carbon health carbonhealth.com go and visit them go get your health care checked out today look it's christmas time this is the time for the new year we're, we're on the precipice of the new year you want to get ready eat the candy eat the holiday stuff then right afterwards go get taken a look at by people at carbon health so you can get a good health plan set up for 2023 if is, you need it if you need is it, it look, is it is it poison candy what no i'm just just say it puts on weight so maybe what candy are you candy. what candy are you eating at the holidays that, yeah. that you need to go to the hospital right afterwards yeah, too, man, too much <laughs> too much of it that's for damn sure it's that old 1970s candy with the red wrappers yeah it's what i'm eating Oof. anyway uh we're gonna get to all that so big shout out to carbonhealth.com make sure you download the app as well to have a dock in your pocket for these issues that might pop up with you on the road maybe you travel to see friends and family maybe something happens having that app on your phone you'll be able to find a new uh, a place there like Carbon Health, a new uh, Carbon Health, you can go visit and take a look at and have them check you out for sure. Um, all right, so let's get into it. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. There's already 56 of you joining us right now. Make sure you hit a like on this video. And if you want to send in your questions, start sending them now as Super Chats or Streamlabs. It's pinned in the chat. It's right there on the screen. It's in the description of this video. So uh, Mike Vogel, we always love to start with you. Overall thoughts here, Avatar, The Way of Water, Jake and Atiri are, are a husband and wife now. They're mother and father, the leaders of the tribe. They have children. And they get chased out by a Navi Quaritch uh, who's come back here and a General Edie Falco leading a much more driven and technologically advanced human race to come down and take care of Pandora and kind of stake their claims to Pandora. They're pushed out to the reef uh, tribes here to try to find some uh, um, solace and it ends up causing problems for them. And at the end, we have this massive final battle. So, Thoughts overall on this sequel, 13 years in the making for Avatar, as you uh, think about it now, a couple days later. I mean, look, as you said, I'm a big fan of the first Avatar. Yes. I really think it's a great movie. I enjoy it. I love watching it. I was excited about Avatar 2, The Way of Water. I went to go see Avatar 2, The Way of Water, <laughs> and I was not disappointed. Uh, James Cameron did it again for me. Don't bet against James Cameron. Now, that being said, uh, I'll throw out my very few things, like, Look, James Cameron's writing is James James Cameron's writing. It, mm. it is what it is. I th I actually think, I was saying this to Shannon the other night, I think maybe the fact that his writing is sort of a little on the nose might be part of his charm. He taps into something that just works for wide audiences. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it is, but he's got some kind of magical combination of cutting-edge special effects and kind of cheesy storylines that kind of work for you, and it works for me. So I ate it up. Um I think some of the cuts in the movie were a little weird. There were so many stories going on. You would like, yeah. you would like, you, you were cutting around from stuff so much. And when we saw it in the IMAX theater, 
uh, the 48 frame uh, rate, yeah, 48 yes. frames per second rate at the beginning for the first like 15 minutes, I the best way that I could liken it, and I apologize to anybody who thinks this is weird, but I was like, it's like when I did mushrooms at Burning Man <laughs> and there was so many flashing lights and the mushrooms hit really hard and I was just overwhelmed. <laughs> so like that's like the first like 20 minutes or so of Avatar. Yeah. My eyes were so overwhelmed with information that I felt like I was maybe having like a really bad trip. But then my eyes sort of adjusted and I loved it. Like I did not get up to go pee once. I was into it. I was emotional. I did not get bored. Mm -hmm. I could have James Cameron have me floating around underwater in Avatar for four hours, and I would probably be satisfied. So, yeah. uh, look, I think there's definitely, like, ins and outs to the story that we can discuss what worked, what didn't work. But mm -hmm. overall, this was a huge win for me. I was very, very happy. Okay, yeah. Shannon, we, you know, some new things are approached here from uh, James Cameron's point of view. We're going to young son of Quaritch Spider who's kind of uh, involved in this little bit of the Jungle Book kind of vibe to his character a little bit, hanging out with the Navi. Then you have Kiri, who is, in essence, uh, Sigourney Weaver reborn in some way. We don't know who um, the uh, father is. A lot of speculation that it might be old Norm there. We don't know who the dad is. And how that, and then that relationship comes together. We see Loak. Midi chlorians. It's huh? midi chlorians. The midi chlorians. That's it, right? Exactly. We see Loak, the second son. Loak be uh, someone who's a real focus of the story. It's like a secondary protagonist in this movie here in his journey that he goes on, connecting with that uh, um, that uh, uh, solitary Tunkun, Tukul, and then all the stuff going on here that happened between the tribes initially, kind of sheltering um jake and atiri and then getting involved in the battle here against quaritch and quaritch struggling with his feelings going one way or the other because of his son actually affecting him uh so what do you think about this entire film here as a sequel to 2009's avatar um i was not quite as taken with it as as okay. mr vogel okay. um and part of the reason did have to do with that high frame rate um, because wow. okay. it, it, to me, it was like, it was like a video game cutscene mixed with uh, British melodrama from the eighties. Um, so that kind of kept <laughs> <What>? pulling me, <laughs> Wait, pulling what? me out, <laughs> kept pulling me out of the story. <laughs> um, and I think also when you go into those, uh, high frame rate sections or, especially with the action yeah. that there is a bit of a weightless quality to some of it mm. that again, just, it just kept yanking me out of the story. Now yeah. from beginning to end, I mean, I, I enjoyed the movie. I like, Hey, this was a, this was a great ride and this, yeah. and, and watching it in IMAX, this, this was the way to do it. Like this is a mm -hmm. terrific experience. Um, am I going to watch this movie on my television at home? Probably not. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my tv's not that big <laughs> um it's, it's so a, as an experience like look it was a lot of fun and if this is one of the things that gets people back into the movie theaters i mean mm -hmm. i think there's only there's only positives to come out of this mm -hmm. like i i want the movie to do well because i want the theatrical experience to keep going yeah. um even though it did this is not necessarily a world that i'm that invested in um as a ride it was still really good yes the writing there there are i, I imagine there's quite a bit of subplot left on the cutting room floor with some <laughs> of the characters um because there are kind of gulfs and leaps in logic i'm like wait a minute no why why are you doing that yeah like okay i i get it <laughs> um but overall, look, it was it was uh, it was a fun theatrical experience. But I think that's probably where it stops with me. I don't think I, I would not have nominated this for best picture of the year. In my wow. opinion, wow, it's 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 being nominated in some of these awards uh, <laughs> uh, circles. So we shall see what the Oscars say about this. All could be very interesting if they if Avatar to the Way of Water is what pushes Top Gun Maverick maybe out of contention for a best picture. You never know with the Oscars. Maybe they're both going to be included. You just never know. Uh, where they're at right now i'll say this for those of you who maybe don't follow me on social media you see me you saw me post about it um if you haven't seen me post about it my thoughts are this i really enjoyed the hell out of this thing i was so surprised i went in with my arms folded i was like please just no unobtainium no boring story it's three hours and 12 minutes am i gonna feel the drag of this and I absolutely loved it. I think it nailed everything visually that Cameron was going for. The technology here advanced so far that finally 
Cameron waiting to do the movie until it could fit what he wanted to do with it made so much sense as you saw him use it so well. None of this stuff felt because I had watched Avatar the 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 that afternoon before I went to see this the sequel here to kind of reacquaint myself with the world of Pandora a little bit and some of the story beats and the look of it. And you can tell some of that technology is a bit outdated, a bit see-through, and the CGI isn't as strong. I did not feel that way watching the movie here in all the different lands and all the different places we went to under the underwater stuff was really extraordinary. All of it worked so well. And I liked the story. I really did. I connected with Loak's journey. I connected with what he was trying to do with Soraya. I connected with Cliff Curtis and Kate Winslet's characters there uh, as those, as that tribe, as the, as the water tribe, there, trying to protect their land and trying to figure out where they fit in this whole situation, whether they want to protect Jake and Natiri or not. And then what it means and getting involved with a new culture. And I really loved uh, Stephen Lang coming back. who I think is kind of the, unsung hero of this entire situation he was even more vicious this time around even more brutal and scary this time around and having a crew of navi who are evil is kind of an interesting new thing to introduce here because clearly it can't just be navi always good human always bad it's got to expand if you're going to go into multiple installments so where are the bad navi where is the koba of the navi so this kind of thing that you're introducing the possibility I liked, and I liked the way they dropped the seeds of stuff to let you to be give, put a little mystery in your mind about what's coming in the future installments. But the connective tissue with everything here just worked. Yeah, do I have some issues with the writing? Some issues with where there's some beats repeated from the first movie? Sure, sure. But I think that they earned it, like underwater, the tree, and the connective, <clears throat> all that stuff. I kind of really enjoyed. It, so yeah, it's kind of a James Cameron special, though. I mean, yeah. like James Cameron is literally he knows the master. Do, uh, but he, but to to your point about like repeating beats, yeah, yeah. Um, Aliens is literally alien, but bigger. Like in yeah, Alien, yeah, yeah. they blow up the ship. She escapes on the other ship. The alien is there. She blows it out of the airlock. Right. Aliens, they blow up the planet. The queen is on the ship. They blow the queen out of the airlock. It's the same movie. It's just fucking bonkers. Yeah. Terminator Two is terminator one i mean it's the same thing like like he, he and, and i don't mean that as a criticism yeah. because i think that aliens and terminator 2 are two of the best sequels ever made mm -hmm. but he it is a thing that james cameron um bring up this comment that Derek johnson uh, yeah, yeah. uh made about uh about how we would have destroyed james Cam any other movie like it, it's interesting because is this movie filled with tropes and all kinds of stuff and we all talk about james cameron's dialogue a hundred percent it yeah. is like that's part of what james cameron is but we have made fun of james james cameron's writing in titanic we yeah. have made fun of his writing in the first avatar and i don't think it's it's like it's not the bug it's the feature yeah like we keep saying james cameron's movies make bajillions of dollars and everybody in the entire world goes to see them yeah. despite his bad writing but i don't think that's it i think he taps into something that is super basic and primal that like you you watch these audiences and people are just invested and yeah. there's some weird combination of top of the line special effects and pushing the boundaries of what we can see on cinema mm -hmm. but at the same time he's telling a story that even if we don't all want to admit it uh and it doesn't work for everybody for sure yeah something about it something about james cameron's style of storytelling clearly connects with audiences yeah, that's a good point. Let's bring up this super chat here. Major Laser is saying, is Jake and Natiri's son, Loak, being set up to replace Jake Sully as the series protagonist? I think that's an excellent question. It certainly was a thought that occurred to me because they spent a lot of time showing you his journey throughout this movie. Not the eldest son. So when the eldest son was killed, I was like, well, that makes sense because we've been focusing on the middle I child. Mean, but I also think they're setting up something here with uh, Natiri and I think Jake, I think Jake Sully is going to die either in the next installment or the installment after that. And either Natiri or Loak take over the tribe or take over leading the family for sure. That's what I think they're setting up here. What do you guys think? I mean, if they get if they get to five movies, like his 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 uh, his plan, um, yeah, they're it is gonna one, get to five movies. Come it, on, it is one hundred percent going to be Loak's story, and yeah. th that that would be that would be my guess. Um, I I don't think it would be Natiri because I don't know. I feel I feel like Zoe Saldana kind of got the short shrift in this one. Yeah, um, she was a little um, bit to the side. Yeah, it's a fair point. And and honestly, I think. I don't have an issue with any of the performances. I do think Zoe Saldana is the best yes. in this format. Like Number she, one. 
all of her all of her big moments are so effective. I mean, yeah. there's just something that I, I I would credit the visual artist as well as her performance. But there is a way that she performs that just screams through the effects that mm-hmm. you can see her. You can just see everything that she's doing in a way that it doesn't quite read for me with some of the other mm-hmm. characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I hope that going forward, I, I hope she gets more of a chance to be a little more featured the way she was in the first movie. But ultimately I do think it's going to be, it's going to be low ox story. Yeah. You make an excellent point, Shannon, having watched the first film into the second film, she really stands out as the best of the bunch in her ability to convey genuine emotion through the CGI in, in all the losses that she experiences. She loses her dad. She loses her firstborn son. She loses her tribe. She loses her land, seeing it burn. I'm just done with Neytiri crying. I don't want any more crying. They, they keep defaulting to her crying, and she does such a good job of it. But, like, let's move on from that, and let's have the warrior. So when she showed up at the end of the movie, that warrior, savage, primal uh, fighter, I was like, hell yes, give me more of that, Neytiri. I want to see that woman. Enough with her, you know, kind of like letting Jake lead the way or letting Jake apologize for her. Let her lead the way for a little bit, for God's sakes. Uh, Mikey, what's your thoughts on, on this idea? Do you think Loak will eventually take over the series? I, well, I don't. Well, two things. One, uh, yeah. in defense of Natiri's tears, I actually love that Natiri is a character that can be hyper emotional and hyper badass at the same time. Mm. I think that we usually default that if you have a female character, she's either the weepy emotional character or she's a badass. Mm. And uh, I love that Natiri has such a love for Pandora and a love for her people and a love for her home that she will she gets so upset and so emotional about things, yeah. but at the same time is a straight badass. Now, yeah. I do think she does get a little bit of short shrift in this movie. I agree with Shannon because I do like she's my I think she's just the star of the first Avatar film. Yeah. And I love her so much that the challenge of this movie is this entire movie is thematically about avoiding violence versus standing up. Yeah. Uh, and Jake is trying desperately to protect his family by avoiding a confrontation. The Tulkun, as a race of, as a species, avoid violence. And that's why Pycon, uh, Pyacon was this outcast. So Natiri being the voice of, let's go fucking fight, yeah. she is sort of held back and held back. But boy, when they let her go, they let her go. Like it, mm-hmm. that last hour, I was like, God. Damn. Yeah. Um, as far as Loak, you know, they've said um, James Cameron and like the creative team have said that the the three movies are kind of one story, and yeah. depending on how two and three do, they'll they'll maybe do four or five, maybe they won't do four or five. I don't know that Loak takes over the entire series. I think the next movie might really be Loak's movie uh, mm-hmm. with Loak and Soraya kind Soraya. of stepping in for Jake and Natiri. Yeah. But I think that James Cameron might have a multi-generational story at play. Like I, four and five might be about Loak and Soraya's children or yeah. what happens to Spider and I'm assuming Kiri's descendants, yeah. but whoever, I mean, you know, like I just think that this idea that the third, the third Avatar movie might wrap up a story Right. And that, that there's another kind of four and five that tells it. I don't think that three, four, and five are all Loak. I think it might be Jake and Natiri to Loak and Soraya and potentially Kiri and Spider uh, on to whatever's next after that. Oh, that we don't know yet. Or the, lo- the younger two, sister. Yeah, two, she might, yeah, two two. might be involved in some way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's great stuff here. Let's take a quick break and we'll jump into some of the storylines here um, uh, in the show uh, right after this. Come on, Shannon. I wasn't sure if we were doing it. And look, it was fast. So I think. Hey, hey McClung. Hey, McClung. I see you. I see you. Um, we got 119 of you watching right now. Please make sure you hit a like on this video. And if you're watching later, hit a like and leave a comment as well. Your thoughts on uh, what we're talking about here in uh, Avatar The Way of Water. And if you want to send a stream lab that's uh, pinned in the chat or send in the super chat, Feel free as we go along. We'll answer it here on the show. So let's move on to these storylines. Let's, let's, let's spend a little time here uh, breaking down the storyline with Jake and Natiri, breaking down the storylines um, with Kate Winslet and Kim Curtis and what they're doing uh, with their characters there uh, on the Reef Tribe. So let's talk about this. Like, what did you guys think? I'll go to you, Shannon, first on this one. Jake and Natiri putting it together, having a family, connecting with their children losing their land jake being the one that wants to run thinking this is the smart move surrendering being the king of of the people there running off taruk makto huh taruk makto taruk okay 
All right. Somebody studied before the review. I respect that. <laughs> somebody, somebody, just watched, somebody just watched Avatar 90,000 times. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yes. Okay. Well said. But yes, moving on to this situation here where we have Ronal and Tonawari uh, protecting them and then what they experienced here with Loak uh, kind of uh, pushing back against some of the controls that they want to put on him, uh, seeing uh, what Kiri is going through, her emotional journey, uh, connecting with Ewa, connecting with the planet, what she's feeling, all of this stuff here. And of course, we see um, we see what Loak goes through, connecting with the whale there and, and what he's feeling and all of that. So what did you think about the storylines with Jake and Nishir and the children throughout? How did that affect you? Did they, You say it didn't 100% work for you, but what about it did work? And then please highlight what you felt the kind of maybe dropped the ball or didn't quite get there for you. Well, I mean, I, again, I don't have any issues with any of the individual storylines. I think okay. there's just so much. Really? Okay, um, so you feel they're, overwhelmed, they're, you would say. It's it's just, it's a lot of movie. It's, okay. it's so much movie. And it's it's the, it's the type of thing that there i'm i'm interested in all the stories i'm invested and i still feel like there's still stuff missing here like mm. uh mateo his whole purpose in the movies to die <laughs> i mean yeah kind of, so yeah. it's sort of like i i like i wish we would have gotten a little bit more with him uh yeah uh the whole Korich angle like i feel that relationship with spider there is a there's just such a gulf in between spider is being taken capture mm. and suddenly spider's helping. It's like, it, yeah. like, I, like I get, I get what was supposed to have transpired, but it's like, I feel like we needed, I feel like I needed a little bit more to really understand the fact that spider is willingly helping these people who have, who are, who are out to get his adopted family mm. for the most part. Um, but the Jake and the Teary and yeah, their but- kids, there are arcs here, right? I mean, Jake, by the end of the movie, realizes he's got to stay and fight for his land instead of running. Uh, mm-hmm. Nateri is connected uh, you know, with the loss of her child, but she now re-embraces being the warrior woman, Even and her dad's bow breaks. So in essence, her being broken of that promise, now more focused to walk the path that she wants to walk. The kids with Kiri connecting to Awa mm-hmm. more. Loak by, Loak, by the end, kind of embracing him coming into power and his voice. And what he wants to do took not so much going on there, but and then Spider, yeah. So, yeah. Overall, what do you think of how they carried this art, these arcs through in the storylines here in this movie? I think it, I think it was just a lot of material. It was a lot of material, and there still wasn't enough room to get everything for me that that I would have liked to have seen in it. Now, what's the solution to that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's like, do you want to subtract any storylines? Because again, all the right. stuff that we got was was good, um, but. You know, Jake's standing and fighting, Loak, you know, becoming, you know, becoming based, you know, the eldest son after after uh, Mateo dies. Like, I thought all of that, I thought all of that worked. Like, and the whole uh, 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 Kiri storyline, like, we're not supposed to know, you know, that's that's a, that's a question that's being set up for the yeah. third for the third movie. I mean, I'm interested in it as a concept, right. um, but the stuff that pulled me out were the visuals. Um, like it would be, I would be getting into a storyline and then there would be a shot that again would look like a video game and it would just kind of pull me out. Mm. Um, I would be willing, cause I saw, uh, I saw it in 3d in IMAX. I would be interested to see, see it without the 3d and to see if visually it keeps me in it a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I went and saw it in um, screen X when it was like surrounded by, so it's not in 3D, but it's in Screen X, which I thought was a really interesting way to see this movie. Very beautiful. You got to focus on the visuals. So maybe, yeah, maybe you're right, Jim. Maybe go and see it without it being 3D. You might be even more uh, connected to what was going on in the film. It's possible. That's certainly possible. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that. I, I like that kind of set, the screen smoothing, all of it. I'm a big fan of it. I love it. So for me, the more the better. Like the Hobbit movies, I was like so in love with that shit. I, I like it for whatever reason, but I know some other people don't. So, uh, Michael, your thoughts on the storylines here with Jake and Atir and, her, and his and their children, rather, and, and what they went through and how it was laid out here in the uh, film. Do you feel the same way that a couple of these didn't quite get enough um, of uh, story behind them to really hit that uh, emotional beat by the end there with Mateo? Or do you think that maybe there was enough here for you to enjoy with what Cameron was doing here? Well, I think that 
when you have a movie that's clocking in at three hours and you have a bunch of story <laughs> like like the the solution to Shannon's point is mm-hmm. cuts and storylines. And mm-hmm. if you don't want to cut storylines, it's less of like what Shannon was like, you know, Shannon said these stories needed more. I, I would argue that I don't think that every storyline needed more. I think we got it, but I don't. But I think that maybe you might be left wanting more, which is fair. Like with Loak and Natayam, I am sure that there is a bunch of scenes on the cutting room floor with them as brothers kind of developing out that relationship. Because I do agree that Natayam, kind of from a very early point in the movie, you're kind of like, yeah, you don't have a lot of personality. I'm pretty sure you're going to die. <laughs> like you are you are here to die but so i think that you know like that but you got the relationship you got like like you got it like natam was the the son who obeyed dad he was the son who was like mom and dad were like you're great and loak was the problem kid who kept like fucking up and getting in trouble so you got it you might have wanted more but it worked with spider and quaritch it's kind of the same thing like young kid finds out who his dad is knows that his dad killed his sort of adopted dad, is kind of thrown into this situation, gets to go out with his dad and the soldiers and do his thing. Like, you get it. Mm-hmm. I, I got what happened. Like, every scene with Quaritch and Spider, he was kind of like, okay, well, this game's maybe not so bad until they went to the Metcaina tribes and on the islands and started basically, like, yeah. laying waste to everything. And then he was like, fuck this shit. I got to get out of here. So it all worked. Uh, it all made sense. It all tracked. And when you have this many characters with this many things going on, the fact that everything like was laid out and was clear, it's pretty good. Like that's a pretty good feat. Now, is it the most artistically handled thing? Is it the bet the most uh, subtle characterizations? No, like it's it's all pretty like on the nose of what it is. But every piece of it was working. I think. You know, they said early on that this movie was more of the kids' movies. So yeah. I think you really do see Jake and Natiri kind of working more as obstacles to the kids. Like, Jake is like, we're not going to fight, we're going to run. And yeah. Natiri's like, I don't want to run, I want to fight, but we're going to be a united front as parents. And so they're both kind of really put to the side for a lot of the movie until the end when they have to step up. And it really is a lot more about Kiri dealing with her uh, her connection to Awa. Uh, her connection to Grace, Sigourney Weaver, her mom, right. kind of the mystery of who she is or who her father might be or who her father might not be. And then Spider's relationship with Quaritch and Loak kind of like stepping into this role and becoming this person and like kind of having his connection with Pyacon. So that's the those are the main characters of the movie. Yeah. Um, and I think those storylines, like I said, like it's that weird James Cameron, Cameron mystery. Are they the most subtle, artfully done beautifully written storylines no but they clearly work so you got i got what i needed to get out of it okay fair enough yeah i like the storylines i connected to all of them followed them through i don't know i didn't feel as overwhelmed as as you guys seem to have indicated that you were i was like i was just in all the way the whole time and loved how they laid everything out but i do agree shannon there's a little bit missing on some of the stories uh, for example, with Roland, uh, Ronald and Tonawari, we rarely have any scenes with them alone doing anything without the uh, without um, uh, Jake or Neytiri or their kids around. So we don't get to know them as a relationship aside from them interacting with Jake and Neytiri and, the, and, and their family. So uh, that's a little bit that's missing. But I also kind of chalk that up in my mind, too. We're going to get much more with them in the next movie because I don't think Kate Winslet would take a role like this without it having much more to explore and flesh out if she wasn't going to be also doing that in the next movie where we're really going to get more time now that Jake has accepted that he is reef people and he is hundred percent. This is his home and he's going to fight for his home and defend his home. Certainly we're setting up Edie Falco being the main villain yeah. going into the third movie against the reef people and Jake and interior and their family. So and drinking a lot more coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drank yeah. a lot of coffee in this movie. <laughs> well, let's deal well, let's deal with the Quaritch situation. And we'll hit Ronald and Tonawari as well. But let's with Quaritch. Uh Mike, I go to you. Like, what, what did you like the way that they brought Stephen Lang back, his character back? Did you think it was a little bit of retconning or convenient retconning to bring him back? Oh, we saved your memories. We had Giovanna Rabisi coming back and doing a cameo. And him recording that thing. Did you like, by the way, I kind of missed Giovanni Ribisi in this movie. I'll be honest with you. It was nice to see him for a few seconds. And I want a little more of that energy in some way. Uh, But what did you think about how they brought him back and how did he work in the movie? And as you touched on 
a little bit more uh, with the situation with Spider. How did you think this all worked? Because clearly they're setting him up like he's Jamie Lannister. We're going to end up cheering for Quaritch by the end of these movies, I have a feeling. I just, I'm just i telling you, I have a feeling we're uh, going to start liking Quaritch by the end of the third movie. Yeah, I mean, Quaritch, most of Quaritch's storyline is by definition a retcon. Yes, um, right, fair but, point. <laughs> but by the way... Uh, most of Star Wars stuff that we all love is major retcons. There's a reason that Leia is smooching Luke in one movie and then is his sister yeah. in the next movie. I mean, like, <laughs> we, like, like, let's just let's just be honest. Like, Good point. retcons are like there are bad retcons. Right. right. There are so-so retcons, and there are great retcons. Um, the Quaritch stuff gives us a villain that I think is a thousand times more interesting than Quaritch is in the first Avatar movie. Mm -hmm. In the first Avatar movie, he's kind of there to just be the obstacle for the Navi people and for Jake to fight. And he doesn't really bring a lot to, I mean, he's a great actor and he brings as much as was there to give to the role, but there's not a lot of there there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now you have a guy who hated the Navi, who now is a Navi, who is dealing with his mortality or lack of mortality dealing with this son that he now has and this relationship and like he is just a fascinating character now like he's way he's there's so much more for him to play with um even his like and this is something that didn't really exist in the first movie but not only is he really got an issue with jake sully he's got a major issue with Natiri because she's the one who actually killed him. Yeah, the arrows. Yeah. And the way that he kind of refers to her as Jake Sully's batshit crazy wife and like she's like a psycho and whatever. And then the confrontation that the two of them have at the end yeah. Yeah. with uh, with Kiri and with Spider, like it it's just, he's so, and to your point, John, the ending of the movie, like mm. him, you actually seeing this guy who is our bad guy, we hate him, but seeing his... Um, emotional distress that spider's not going to go with him i mean yeah. like all of a sudden there's this sort of character who even though i love the first avatar movie who a very one-dimensional villain in the first movie yeah. and now has a lot more dimension and in a movie that across the board is dealing with family and connection and what does a family mean on every level and that's where james cameron writing aside sort of hits it out of the park for me mm. is that as we're watching Jake and Natiri and the Sullys and what it means for them to be in a family, and then we have Quaritch over here with Spider and what that means as a family, and the connection between the Metkayina and the Tulkun uh, and their family right. connection, and the right. Tulkuns themselves, like, like it's just family, 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 family. It's just across the board. So the fact that our villain is having a family issue as our heroes are having a family issue, like I think this is where I go, okay, well, is it retconning? Absolutely. But did the retconning win because it gave us something that was way better and more interesting? I think yes. Yeah. I mean, even Spider gets a shot in, right? When he's like, well, I thought, Spider, I thought they sent you back. So you don't, they don't put uh, babies in cryo. Uh, shit. Uh, yeah, shit. <laughs> oh, that was really good. So, um, Shannon, what did you think about how they brought Corridge back? Stephen Lang coming. I mean, Stephen Lang has been acting since the 1980s, ladies and gentlemen. So to have him be a predominant villain in this, in this film and antagonist, for lack of a better term here, see him, see his character kind of uh, get some more levels, as Mike was stressing, get some more depth to play, some more interesting angles to explore with him, especially near the end when they tear, when he doesn't kill uh, Natiri, doesn't kill Took there to, or Kiri rather, to, Kiri. Um, to uh, uh, sacrifice uh, Spider. He, he, say, he says, okay, okay. You know, he kind of gives in and then Spider saves him and he's really heartbroken that Spider doesn't stay with him. What does this all mean? So, what did you think about how they handled all of this? And they didn't shirk on him being a terrible person and certainly hit on the themes of colonialism and burning tribes, burning lands, burning um, uh, their areas there. We saw that being connected with Quaritch uh, and Spider witnessing all of that. So what did you think about all of the arc that they laid out here for Quaritch? I, I mean, we kind of figured that this is this was this is the thing that would have to be done to bring that character back mm. um, because he's, he's quite dead um, at the end of the first movie. Yes, he is. <laughs> um, but yeah. Stephen Lang is a terrific performer. And I do agree with Mike that this, 
this putting him in the body the way he the way he said it in the movie you know we've been damned to be in the body of our bodies of our enemies yeah um that's such a fascinating uh, uh approach for a character and for an actor as talented as Stephen lang is um that's a really fun thing for him to to wrestle with and to play with um what's really interesting is i'm actually listening to uh, arnold schwarzenegger's uh, autobiography uh, autobiography total recall right okay. now and Stephen lang reads most of it Oh my he's, God! Really? He, he's he's the narrator. Um, so like he, listening to him nice and calm, and then watching him play Quaritch, it, it was a really fun dichotomy. Um, I don't feel like that moment where he uh, when he says like you know that kid's not mine. We're not related. That I believed. I don't feel like his uh, not wanting to sacrifice Spider. I didn't feel that was quite earned. Okay. Um, because in what we saw with them, like we saw him burning the villages and Spider telling, no, don't do that, don't do that. It, it, Spider, you know, trying to reach out to his, you know, Navi, Navi brethren. Um, I don't feel like we had that moment between Corich and Spider that mm -hmm. justifies him not wanting to lose his lose the human his human son. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of those moments that I'm like, I, I would have liked to have seen some sort of connection between the two of them and i think that moment plays a, a lot better then because as it, it was do you think it would have undercut it though because then you would have kind of anticipated him choosing I, the yeah son. i i agree I, I that's what i was gonna say mm -hmm. i and this is this gets into the weeds of like this is like a fun geek conversation because there's mm. no right answer to this like this is a you make a completely valid point that yeah. i agree you are right that that moment isn't in the movie i wonder and i don't know but I wonder if that movie, that moment isn't specifically in the movie because I agree with you. When he says at the end of the movie, go ahead and kill him. I don't care. He's yeah. not mine. I'm not related to him. I did believe him. Mm. I fully believed him. And then when Natiri went in and he backed off, I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, Quaritch. Looks like you care about Spider a little more than you let on for this entire movie. Yeah. And then the pain that he has at the end, I think tease it up really nicely for some really complicated stuff in the third movie, but that gets into, um, I mean, that gets into a very subjective, like, okay, well, this just gets into like the type of storytelling you want. Like, I, I feel yeah. like that might have been kept up, kept out of, kept they they might have avoided it on purpose yeah. deliberately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see, and I don't feel like that interrogation room where where they have that kind of first conversation. Yeah. I don't think there was enough there to justify what ended up happening. But as you guys both said, I mean, if if they had hit it too hard, yeah. maybe that maybe that moment uh, it would have just been a little too telegraphed. But yeah. for me, it's like the the connection just wasn't there. I mean, you do have that moment where he's being where Spider is being hypnotized in that super creepy ass. Oh my god, that came out of trap. nowhere. Uh, with Edie Falco just being yeah. cool as a cucumber, sipping her Starbucks, being like, let's do this shit. And like Quaritch comes in and stops it and kind of like, let me handle this in a different way. And she like just dead eyes him and he's like, he's not your son. Yeah. And it, you know, and again, like you could play that as Quaritch is just being super manipulative, but I think that was a hint of what was to come. But yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's subtle either way. Agree. So, so yeah, he seemed like he saw his son struggling. We saw like like a little bit of blood coming out of Spider's nose. So clearly, and that was really uns I'm, obviously this is a, it's a Guantanamo reference, a waterboarding reference. Obviously, there's some a statement that Cameron was making with that because it seemed to come out of nowhere. But sure, and it's you know we've seen humans attacking. We've seen that as a kind of um, a connecting connection to what has gone on in the past with colonialism and what have you. So we were able to connect with that as an audience in the first movie and certainly into this movie as well. But all of a sudden that thing spinning around messing with a young child's brain, that's, that's going next level with the torture and the anger and the, the, uh, um, the terrible things that humans can do to people sometimes. So I, I was really surprised by that. And I agree with you, Mike, if, the, if we're looking at the subtlety and the, maybe the, the lower levels here, you're catching that the reason he stops it, although he says, let me give it a shot. It's because he, he's starting to develop some, kind of instinctive care for something that is his, even though he is not actually Quaritch taking on the memories. You could argue he's in essence become Quaritch. And so what does that mean? Yeah. So by the end, when he does what he does, it is slightly believable because, or it is believable because of what you've seen uh, go before. So, yeah, I liked it. I thought it was great. Anything, anything to get, give extra, give Stephen Lang extra time. I'm hundred percent happy to see it. And I do think the fact that he didn't kill um, the other members of the tribe, when when he had his guy putting the uh, 
the uh, rifle uh, to the woman's head when he didn't kill the woman. It was though he burnt the, their houses and their huts and what have you. Um, the fact that he didn't kill the women, the woman kind of opened the door to the possibility that he isn't quite yet, or he's kind of changing in how he's doing this. And also him being Navi, at some point, that's going to affect why he does the things that he does, or if he does Maybe. the things that he does. I just, I got a feeling Maybe. we're going to be cheering for uh, Quaritch before the end of the, his time on Pandora. Just I leave. mean, I, yes, I do feel like they're kind of teeing him up for some sort of redemptive arc. Yes, yeah. I agree with you. Just like Star Wars, Mike, as you said. Um, and let's move on uh, real quick to Ronald and Tonawari as we wrap up the storyline conversation in terms of the uh, story. So how did you think about this, Mike? How did you feel about them being introduced and being a part of this as a new reef tribe, getting obviously connection to the Polynesian cultures there, Cliff Curtis being of Maori descendants, uh, uh, being descended from Maori. And uh, and uh, Kate Winslet, though, you know, all white woman playing this character. But did you like the vibe that you got of how a camera was opening the door to a Polynesian culture and exploring all of that and, and being um, and kind of just putting that out there like we explored in essence a Native American culture through the Navi in the first movie. I mean, I, I love the Met Kaina in mm -hmm. general. Uh, I thought they were great. And I thought that as characters, the two of them did really great work. I mean, yeah. like would I have liked to have seen, you know, you can say you, I mean, you can say this about most of the characters in the movie, most of the storylines. Would I have liked to have seen more with them? Sure. Yeah. Movie's three hours and 12 minutes. Like, I, 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 you know, like, I, I don't know what to tell you. But, but I think for the time that they are both in the movie, they are so strong as performers. And yeah. their perspectives are so clear that they were just a joy to watch. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, I, in general, like I said, I found, I found the Met Kaina to just be kind of like beautiful and awesome and amazing in yeah. general. Like I was like, I could stay. I, it's, it's the way I felt when I saw Avatar the first time where I was like, I could go stay in that tree and hang out with, uh, with the Navi forever. It's why I just get drunk and wander around Pandora when I go to Animal Kingdom in Orlando. I'm just like, Hey, I'm here. I'm here. Um, so yeah, I mean. I, I don't have a ton to say except that I thought they both did great, particularly him though. Yeah. Like there was, he had some really great funny moments. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk a lot about how Zoe Saldana's performance kind of shines through the shines through the mocap and shines through the effects. But I think he had some really great moments that yeah. really like shine through as well. Just some really subtle things, uh, facial expressions, nods of the head that really made him come to life as a character that you know they were so specific that yeah. you know that wasn't just an animator doing it on a whim it was an animator enhancing what they were taking from the mocap so i think he's another great example of a character that is the perfect marriage of an amazing performance and amazing work by the animation team. Yeah, there are a couple of scenes that stick out to me with him. Certainly that scene when after they've uh, after Quaritch and his crew have attacked one of the outer tribes there, him walking by the um, the hut while they're sitting there and the rain is falling and they're having a laugh, Jake and Natira, and then he walks by. The way he walks by and Jake comes out, there's, there's this kind of him not even looking at Jake talking about what has happened. You know, there's such a strength and a pride to him in that moment. And I love the connection between him and uh, Ronald when they first show up, Jake and Natiri, and she's yeah. like just looking him over and they have that eye exchange with each other as a couple does who've been around a long time <laughs> and known each other a long time. He's just like, come on, honey, can't, let's and she, and She's like, all right, I love you, fine, but this is on you, motherfucker. So I love that. So, um, what did you think about the this um, this new tribe being brought into Pandora here for us to enjoy and explore and discover here with the Polynesian heritage and uh, their pride and strength and even the way they reacted was very Paul. Right when they were ready to war, the sticking out of the tongue—that's the Hakka stuff that you see from uh, the, the New Zealand tribes or the New Zealand uh, uh, people there. So, what did you think about it, um, uh, Shannon? All this stuff. I mean. Uh... I, again, I thought it was beautiful. Uh, yeah. I thought it worked really, really well. I loved their relationship with the the Tulkun. Um, oh, like yeah. I never yes. thought like a, a, a telepathic whale would be so uh, effective. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I really, really liked it. Um, and to the Cliff Curtis and Kate Winslet, like it'll be interesting to see where they go with number three because yeah. based off of what we saw, 
I didn't see the need for Kate Winslet in that role. I'm like, her performance was good. It was, it was, it was, it right. was Any perfectly serviceable. Could have that. Where's yeah, the extra I, oomph? Yeah, I agree with that. I didn't, I didn't get the specialness of her mm. being in that role. Um, did not feel that way about Cliff Curtis. I love Cliff Curtis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there is just, I mean, I think you put it the best way, Johnny, was there's just this uh, uh, noble strength. Yeah. Yeah, that that he has. I mean, the moment where he's kind of dressing down all the kids and it's just like that. Sit, yeah. sit, sit. Yeah. Sit. That boom. I mean, like everyone who's been Everything. yelled at by their father. We've all knows, had that moment. There was that moment where you can see it's like it might be a really long wick and then it goes swick out, and then <laughs> boom. Um. So, yeah, I thought Cliff Curtis was fantastic. And the brief moments that we get between him and Jake as yeah, to yeah, heads yeah. of families, yeah, yeah. as to heads of tribes, watching the way that they connect, I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, the whole everything with with the water tribes, I did, I did really like. I thought it worked really well. Yeah, even the ritual at the end when they're burying, um, you know, their firstborn son. That whole setup with them and kind of the kind of the evening being out on the water, holding the fire, they all look the pride, and then of course the descend uh descending the body down into it was that was that had that was there was so much ceremony to that that was beautiful to witness and watch mm -hmm. you know and i've seen the film taking hits some might say rightfully some might say wrongfully for some of the quote-unquote cultural appropriation but i also think there was a lot of research done here to get the authenticity of what this would be like on a place like pandora what a polynesian culture would look like in pandora so i think there should be credit given to their approach and to the researchers and what they were able to create and and make feel very viscerally real when you were watching it as a viewer um, compared to what we got uh, with the Navi in the first movie, how they were essentially echoing Native American cultures on our on our planet. So um, very interesting stuff for sure. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll jump into some of the themes and symbolism here in uh, Avatar The Way of the Water after this. Okay. All right. I guess we don't want to do it. All right. We'll move on here. <laughs> Michael, you're you're big on themes and symbolism. Let's have a good conversation. We're starting off with you on this one. What did you think about the the approach to family here? Certainly, as you mentioned earlier, family in whatever form it comes in, as we see with Spider, as we see with Kiri being adopted essentially by Jake and Natiri, but also what we see here with Ronald and Tonawari and how they treat their children. Right, you you should know better. Your you understand the situation with Soraya being like you know Soraya kind of going off with um with uh, uh Lowak and and them being upset at her uh and then of course with spider and with uh Quaritch and what that all means what did you think about the themes here uh, of uh, family throughout the movie because of course the themes echoing of colonizing pandora all of that is from the first movie the family stuff really became something prevalent throughout this whole movie yeah i mean like i said like i don't think that james cameron is the subtlest when it comes to themes and symbolism it's it's pretty much right there for all of us to see and you know i was laughing i told somebody we got out of the movie and i was like it's like the fast and the furious movies were like it's all about family and then james cameron was like hold my navi spear like i'm gonna show you a movie about family but uh but you know like from from the sullies like you said from the sullies to the metcaina tribe to quaritch yeah. and spider like this to the to the tolkoon like it is just this movie is all about family dynamics what it means to be a family the strength of family but also the stress of family i mean mm, you know every 100%. single one of these groups like it's not just a hey family's great be there for your family like this movie i think where it works really well and arguably works better than the first avatar movie is like i was saying with quaritch before like quaritch's, quaritch's relationship with spider is infinitely more interesting than anything that quaritch had to do in the first movie because it is complicated like spider knows his dad is a bad dude. It's by the end of the movie, he's very clear on the fact that his dad is a bad dude. Still can't let him die. Right. And boy, all I could think about after that, after he did that and showed back up was like, when Natiri finds out <laughs> that your ass Oh, saved great him, point. Yeah. <laughs> she already barely likes you, dude. But like, but then that's another complicated thing. Like, Spider basically has been raised as a sibling with the Sullys. And they hit that right off the bat. Like, Natiri looks right at him as like, he belongs with his own kind. Yeah. She does not see him as part of the family. And Kiri 
clearly sees Spider as one of the most important people in her life. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just Jake is the hero of the first movie. He's the guy that we love. We were rooting for him all the time. Is he the is he the best dad in this movie? Not always. Yeah. A little militaristic. Really. A little militaristic. A little, little militaristic. Yeah. Like when Natiri says, hey, this is not a squad. Right. It's a family. Yeah. And at the end, man, when um, when Loak is like, I want to come with you with, into the battle, and he looks at his son, he's like, you've already done enough because Natan oh, wow. is dead. Like, boom. Um, so, like, there's just throughout, there's so much. And I think he did a really cool thing that the end of this movie is not Natiri and Jake Sully saving the day. Yeah. Like Natiri and Jake Sully were gonna die, y'all. Yeah. They weren't gonna make they weren't gonna make it off of the Pandora Titanic. Right. Um <laughs> but then the kids showed up and the kids saved the day. And so like the kids who th- for the entire movie they were like, Oh, Kiri, you're having a little bit epileptic seizures, you're kind of weird. Loak, you're kind of a fuck up, you don't know what to do. And those kids show up at the end. So it's really making a statement on, you know, you might be the hero of your story, but eventually there's going to be kids. There's going to be another generation. There's going to be these other people. Yeah. And they're the ones that are going to carry that torch. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a theme that we're going to see reoccurring throughout this. Yeah. What, what's the to you on some of the themes and some of the symbolism here throughout the movie, Shan? Um, I wouldn't say much of the symbolism stood out to me because I'm just I don't watch things like that. <laughs> I, I just don't I don't have those Roka eyes. <laughs> but in terms of the themes, just the the whole you know f- you know family 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 as Vogel already put. Um, yeah, that the the imperfections that go along with having a family. How kids, uh, you know, everyone every family has that one kid who. Um, consistently wants to stick their hand on on the burner right. and that and you know that's that's low um you know i loved the uh adoptive family angle with kiri mm-hmm. uh, i thought that was really really sweet because that's sort of you know that just shores up that connection between sam worthington and sigourney weaver from you know the first movie um so i thought that all worked really well and like over to the uh met Kaina, um everything with cliff curtis and kate winslet when like and obviously not as featured as the Sully's, but everything that they have with their children Mm -hmm. is just, it's just such a different take than it is than, than how Jake is with his sons. Like it's just very, very different. Um, So yeah, I mean, I thought all of that stuff, I, I thought all that stuff worked really well. The, the, I've already, you know, said my piece on the courage and spider angle, but for me, there's just, there's just that missing bit that I think would have shorted up a little bit more. Well, I think, Okay, oh, sorry, sorry. Cool. just really just really quick, I think yeah. another major theme that is very clear that James Cameron is having a strong opinion on is, look, we all love the fact that Luke Skywalker turns his lightsaber off and doesn't fight Darth Vader. And the entire thing that George Lucas talks about with the Jedi is violence begets violence. Yeah. Like, you know, like you you killing somebody in self-defense or you killing somebody out of anger or you doing this like there is a, there is a road that like to be a true Jedi is to like, you know, you put you put the lightsaber down. You're like, I, I, I'm going to trust in the best. James Cameron is clearly being like, sometimes sometimes you got to punch a bitch. Like yeah. James Cameron is very clear. <laughs> this entire movie is Jake Sully being like, we can't fight them. We have to run. Right. And then when you find out that Pyacon is an outcast because when his entire family was destroyed, he took some Tolkun and some Metkayina in and fought and they were all killed. And he was because the Tolkun don't fight. Yeah. And so like when you get that moment when Pyacon jumps out of the water and like just smashes Ooh. on that boat and then all the Metkayina go in. Um, and then to your point, John, the end of the movie is Jake Sully being like, we have to stand and fight. Yeah. Like, so James Cameron is like, look, he's, he's clearly, he's like, look, I get all you pacifists. They're like, let's turn the other cheek. When they go low, we go high. Yeah. We're going to live that life. James Cameron's like, sometimes yeah. you got to jump on the fucking ship and whip your tail around. Like, and I think yeah. that's a major theme in this movie because the, the Tulkun as a species are reflecting what Jake's journey is in this movie. Yeah. It's a great point. As the late, great, 
uh, philosopher Kenny Rogers once said in Coward of the County, sometimes you got to fight to be a man. Yeah, it's true. It's absolutely true. And yet these moments, you see those moments where they're fighting back and pushing back and reclaiming, especially with um, Pyakun when he is, when those harpoons are being shot by that stereotypical Australian, one of the most, one of the least deep people in the movie, uh, his, him deflecting it or dodging those harpoons, that's pretty badass, you know? So I, I, I really, really enjoy that. Let me swing back and hit one more thing before we get out of this family situation. Let's talk about uh, Loak and uh, Pai Kuhn a little bit more and Kiri and her connection to her mother, which is essentially Ewa, which is through the uh, through uh, Sigourney Weaver as we see through Grace as we see in the when she connects to the tree, what she what she sees, uh, what gets revealed to her, and then what doesn't get revealed to her. But that's also kind of a sense of family as he finds a new brother, uh, maybe yeah. foreshadowing the death of his brother. Uh, as he connects with a new brother, which causes a little bit of friction with his older brother there in that moment before he jumps off to go warn uh, Paikun what's uh, what's going to come here. And of course, Kiri being essentially diagnosed as having this epileptic thing, but no, it's because she's really connected uh, as an artist. She's an artist, and so she feels things in a different wavelength than others and connecting to her mom, Ewa, which is the Mother Earth or Mother Pandora in essence, mm-hmm. What do you think about how they established that and the scenes we got with those two separate uh, family uh, dynamics as well? I mean, I loved the Loak uh, Paikun dynamic. Yeah. I-, I thought that was one of the one of the really cool things that that James Cameron did. Like, there's so many big ideas in this movie. There's so many big concepts, and this idea that the Metcaina have these have these relationships, have these, these friendships, these bonds with these whales and how this, this one outlier who's, he's a killer, he's terrible. He's, he's a a villain. And you see the, the kind of the black sheep of, of the Sully family is the one who connects with them. And so just really, I mean, just some really, really kind of beautiful, beautiful stuff there that I, that I thought worked really well. The Kiri stuff, again, I think we're going to find out more of that payoff is coming coming down the line because she, you know, she, watching her, again, like the whole epileptic scene. I mean, Norm and the other actor with the beard. I mean, you want to talk about short shrift. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, don't, scenes. Yeah. I don't think there was anything uh, uh, inherently missing <laughs> from, but I just can see like those guys were so excited to get back to Pandora and be like, Oh, is it, huh? <laughs> one, one week in, one week out. Copy that. Um, but uh, Kiri's relationship to Awa, like I did think that was, I, I did think that was really, really, uh, really effective. And even though it was in the trailer, when she talks about like she feels her heartbeat, like how, how you know, how does it feel? Mighty. Like that's such a great on the nose writing moment. But I did think it worked really, really well. Yeah. What do you think of these relationships, Michael? I mean, clearly. Showing, as Shannon said, that one kid you have in the family that wants to put their hand in the fire, um, you decide for uh, for your family who that might be, Michael. And then the other side, <laughs> this the one member of the family, possibly, that exists in some families that really feels things on a wavelength that you can't quite understand, but feels them so deeply. Because even in that scene when the Tulkun come back and uh, Took is over there trying to grab um, uh, Kiri out of the hut there to have her take a look. She's like, what do you want? Leave me alone. That, you know, the kind of tempestuous teenager who's really kind of caught up in trying to figure out where she belongs and why she doesn't fit. And certainly we have the moments with her talking with Jake and Natiri separately um, about how she feels so out of place with everything. So what do you think about how they handle those two um, characters and their family relationships outside of their actual physical family? Well, first of all, I think who knew that Sigourney Weaver at her age could play such a great teenager? I mean, come on I mean, now. It's, it's very, <laughs> it's very weird, but it yeah. really works. Um, no, I think look in different ways, like you know, Kiri sort of being diagnosed as having these epileptic seizures. To me, it's that whole thing where you have a child in your family who has some kind of disability or has something about them that is you see as a problem or a mm-hmm. challenge that ends up being their strength. Yeah. Right. And that really seems Point. to be like the road they're going down. I mean, I don't know if Kiri has a dad. Like I made I made the midi chlorian joke, but if they pulled a because like the entire 
if you remember Avatar, like they tried to bring yeah. Grace back by doing what they ultimately did to Sully, like to Jake Sully, like they tried to have her spirit go through Awa yeah. and come into her Avatar, and ultimately her spirit was too weak. But I mean, maybe her spirit did make it through into Grace's body just in a different way than we thought. There might not need to have been a father. And I think that if Kiri is like truly a child of Ewa, uh, that'll be something that's, I mean, I, I would actually put my money on that more than there being mm. a father. So, but I could be wrong, but we'll see. But I think that's an interesting mystery and the role that she's going to play in yep. this, you know, battle for Pandora that's gonna come. I think Loak is the MVP of the movie. I think he is such a great character. I think he's so interesting. Um, you know, for all that we kind of are, you know, ribbing James Cameron a bit for the things that he does that are on the nose, to Shannon's point, that whole scene of Loak and Pyacon mm. uh, bonding yeah. and becoming friends is just movie magic. It's absolutely just movie magic. Like, it is so great. And this bond between them is so powerful. And when he really, when Loak wants to know, like, what happened to Pyacon and Pyacon opens his mouth... And he goes in and that's the way, like, it's like Pyacon, like they make a point, um, our favorite stereotypical Australian guy, to your point. <laughs> yes. uh, Come on. <laughs> and Jermaine Clement are talking, when they're talking later and we find out about like the, the whale, the whale brain juice. Um, you know, they, they make a point about how smart the Tulkun are. And in the yes. first movie, yeah. we saw the Navi bond with the Ikron. We saw the Navi bond with different animals. But they were, even though the Ikron bond was really powerful and really strong, and that was like, that was your Ikron for life and you bonded to it forever. Uh, the, the whole bond with the Tulkun is another level because yeah. they are so smart and so intelligent. So it makes it even more powerful. And I think that that just worked so well. Um, and like I said, you know, the more the more that I talk about it, uh, a the more I want to go back and see it again. But um, it's it's this is where this is where this is where the magic of the movie is. Like James Cameron does a thing where he kind of takes it. it like I mean, we joke about it, we joked about it when we were talking about this a few weeks ago. Like when you say that Avatar is Fern Gully meets Dances with Wolves meets Pocahontas uh, meets the Smurfs, it's like yeah. You're not necessarily wrong. There's pieces of all of that, and he put it in a blender. But what came out was super cool and weird, and I'm into it. And like this, this to me is like that, but uh, but even more so in a positive way. Yeah, he's almost like Richard Donner esque, where he's making his um, social commentary or political commentary with organically within the flow of the movie, kind of like um, Richard Donner's Lethal, Lethal Weapon Two with the idea of the tunas and all, you know the whole thing, and so. It's kind of a subtle way that he throws his philosophies in it because we know that James is very much connected to the sea, very much connected to the water. So this idea of having respect for, in essence, the whale species on this planet and the intelligence. If you watch any nature documentary on whales, you realize, they'll tell you how intelligent whales actually really are. Right. Uh, and this idea of, of adding something more to them, that they were seeing songs and composed music and all these kind of stuff. So a nice, interesting kind of groundwork being laid there for something that I think is going to pay dividends uh, in the next movie as well. Um, and Jermaine Clement, please don't do American accents anymore. Jesus Christ, that was breaking my heart listening to him try to do American accent. That was rough. I don't know why they decided to do that with him. Should have just left him with the, uh, his regular accent. That was rough to see. All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll get in some super chats, and then we'll hit the uh, action and, and, and wrap this on up here uh, right after this. Oh, it's too late. It's too late. I, feel, I saw your mouth opening, but it's too late. Let's move on. Here. All right. <laughs> Let's hit some of these super chats. Uh, we've got a very, uh, some strong opinions coming through here uh, from uh, Derek Johnson, who says unacceptable Mike, LOL. We went from unobtainable to whale juice, immaculate conception. That's not how you spell that. Sorry, Derek. The one the outcast son who grows to do a death and is accepted. How many tropes and retcons are we supposed to just accept? One more, a hundred percent. Say this movie is a visual masterpiece, but now the humans want whale juice. James has given us good dialogue and story before, but I'm with Shannon. I sat there and really felt the full weight of that three hours. All right, Mike, I mean, like, totally fair. And you know, I mean, like I said, I like the first Avatar, and I think Unobtainium is stupid. Uh, yes. I was way, I was happy to move from Unobtainium to whale juice. Um, <laughs> and look, I think, but I think that also. If, you, if we're gonna if we're gonna have a movie that is going to slightly stereotypically talk about how bad humanity is when humans are currently 
mining the earth for a bunch of fossil fuels that are going to run out on us and we are also killing elephants for their ivory tusks and dumping the rest of it i think there's more than enough room in these movies for unobtainium whale juice and whatever else he wants to throw at us because humans are clearly the bad guys in fact what was really interesting about avatar 2 to me is that in avatar 1 because jake sully as a character is human for half the movie and navi for half the movie yeah. and you have grace and you have michelle rodriguez and you have norman the other scientists and you have the other characters there is a good number of humans that are sort of hey we're on the navi side and in this movie aside from like norm and the other scientist because all the main characters are now full navi except for spider yeah. uh it really is navi good and humans bad and it's very yeah. interesting to watch a movie as a human and go god i'm really just rooting for the aliens like i want all these humans the fuck out of here and it's yeah. an interesting place to be in so look it it's like I was just saying a, a second ago, James Cameron is the master of taking tropes and cheesy stuff and somehow making it work. Let's not forget, this is the guy that gave us a Terminator that said, I know now why you cry. It's something I can never do. And then gave a thumbs up as he was buried in the lava. Like he's, he's always had his cheesy moments, but it, as opposed to you and Shannon, for some reason it works for me. I am a cheese ball. <laughs> No, I, I like, I, I like, oh, you're talking about, oh, you're talking about uh, Derek, right? Fair point. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, yeah. I think it worked for me too. And I think because you can say it's repetitive, but because humans are repetitive and James is trying to make the point, as I said, he's trying to weave in his social commentary organically in the movie because this is true. Okay. Once we find a new resource, we can go get from you and the anti-aging thing. Humans are obsessed with that shit is a, fucking multi-billion dollar market in our world nowadays everybody trying to find the secret to staying young you see all those celebrities try to promote stuff on commercials all the time about anti-aging so that works the vanity of humans that's what he's kind of getting to the point that they're willing to sacrifice all this because the fact that uh, was it spider who says it or yeah i think it's spider says wait what do you do with the, do you just dump the rest of the whale mm -hmm. that's it and so that kind of thing really hitting the point home uh, or hit, yeah, banging the point home that this is how human beings are, that they just will take the resource and leave a husk of what's left and not use it for anything else. And it's a terrible way to exist. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, any more to add to this? No, I mean, uh, again, I did feel the three hours like Derek. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that the thing that pulled me out was the visuals. So hmm. maybe I will give this one more shot, not in 3D to see if it can see if it can hook me. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, Brennan says, love the Geek Buddies. I googled Avatar 2 just to look up information about it, and Vin Diesel pops up in the search. Did he have a role cut from the film, or is he cast for the potential sequels? I don't know anything There's about a couple people. There's When you look up the Avatar cast online mm -hmm. and where you look at things, there are a couple actors. Uh, Vin Diesel's one of them that pop up occasionally. And yeah. look, the internet's the internet, so that could just be a weird thing. Oh, it was a rumor. Somebody popped it in. But it does seem like there might be a couple people that have been announced and we just haven't seen them yet or yeah. they might be popping up in another in the next movie because a lot of these people have already filmed all their stuff uh, right so right. you know there might be some stuff that's out there in the universe and we don't know we'll have to wait and see until uh we get more information about avatar 3. as Edie he's falco Pi he's piacon he's piacon he's Pi he's Pi <laughs> as Edie falco said i thought this thing had already come out and gone four years ago. <laughs> uh, Derek Johnson says, hey, Roka, I was rushing, okay? LOL, give your boy a break. Yes, Derek, I'm busting balls. <laughs> I'll say one thing, those water Navi were sexy. A lot of detail went into those designs. Um, I don't disagree. Look, Navi are sexy, period. Just to be honest about it. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, all right, and uh, two stream two stream labs real quick. Jim Fan said, I really enjoyed The Way of Water. 3D gives me a headache, but seeing it in IMAX 3D was the way to go. So immersive, visual effects were incredible, and that Rebel Tukun whale getting revenge from that poacher was awesome slash hilarious. Happy holidays, y'all. Um, and Alan Smith, he says, hey, Geek Buds, do you think that Cameron will ever make any more movies outside the Avatar world? I think all his movies are good, even when he isn't doing sci-fi like True Lies. Don't you think three avatars is enough and then Cameron can direct a new flick? Uh, real quick, yeah. What do you guys think about that? I'm actually looking up to see how old James Cameron is. Wow. 62, maybe? He's almost 70. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. I don't know, man. I think he's going to be perfectly <laughs> content to just make his avatar movies. But 
I'm gonna let James Cameron do what James Cameron wants to do. Like if he keeps yeah. doing these Avatar movies at the rate that he's doing them, he's going to just revolutionize all of special effects and cinema like again. Yeah. So yeah, you do you, James. I'm I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, second mile says uh, Poyacon is like uh, Poyacon is like old man Marley from Home Alone. Although that might be because I watched the two movies back to back. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shannon. Uh, before we wrap up, let's hit the action sequences here. Your thoughts on the you know you're our action guy. What did you? Th- I know you you said the 3D and stuff affect you, but the construction of the action sequences that last hour that battle finale, which was an entire hour. What do you think about how they sk- stage these, choreograph these? Did you buy the hand-to-hand stuff? Did you like the pacing and the rhythm throughout the action sequences here? And were they satisfying to you by the end? I mean, for the most part, yes. Okay. Um, the the production design on these movies, I mean, they're next level. I mean, y- you yeah. know, you look at you look at sort of uh, James Cameron imagining these vehicles of the future and how they're, they ha- they're, there's a base in reality. There's a base in stuff that we recognize, but there's that Cameron futuristic twist yeah. that makes things just really, really cool. I mean, and just the, the uh, composition of all of the Mechain coming in on those, you know, the, the, fl- the flying fish, essentially. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. A- as, you know, their, their uh, wings are kind of unfurled and they're, it's like a different color and just coming up to this sort of gray monolith. I mean, it's just a really, really well-constructed shot. And anytime the Navi are shooting arrows, throwing spears, I mean, they look amazing. And, and anytime N- Natiri is firing a, a bow as her uh, Ekron is, you know, going upside down, I mean, everything just looks really, really cool. The problem that I had with some of the high frame rate was, again, that weightless quality mm-hmm. that in my it, in my brain, it clicks like, oh, that's right. This isn't real. And so it doesn't happen with every shot. But there are there are a couple. There was one where one of the speedboats comes up on a reef. And mm. the way that it it kind of you know topples over on itself, it's just so it again it looked like a like an old like an old video game. Mm. So I think the construction is there, um, um, but I'll be curious to see it not in 3D to see if that that weightless quality that you know registered in my brain whether that goes away. The Quaritch Jake fights because they're gone i mean yeah. like, the, like they they've got their kids they're going and when course basically says like i'm never i'm never gonna stop and that then let's get it done like that was just such a great kick-ass line mm-hmm. despite the fact that the actual fight i was i thought was it was okay, okay. um i was much more uh emotionally invested with uh Loak trying to get his dad out when jake is kind of like all right i'm not you know my ticket is punched here like i'm I'm done. Um, I thought that was just much more emotionally satisfying than the two of them going at it. And for, in my head, again, I'm I'm like Jake's been in this Navi body for over a decade. Yeah, yeah. I, he would eat Quaritch's lunch, um, despite the fact that Quaritch yeah. is a soldier, but he's right. still new. So I didn't think the the result quite made sense. I think they're I think and I think they're you know when you're on a sinking ship. There are ways to uh, level out the fight without kind of betraying the character. Hmm. All right, fair point. And what, real quick, what do you think about the amount of death that there is in the movie? There's a lot of death in this movie. A lot of people are killed or smashed by uh, two uh, 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 runaway uh, two coons. Like, it, <laughs> there's a lot of death in this movie. Were you surprised by that? It connected to the action. No, not at all. I mean, and again, this is not like, I hope this doesn't come off as sadistic. Um, but as Vogel already put, you know, the humans for the most part are the villains. And as uh, Pyacon's just whipping his tail and smashing people, it's very effective. It's very satisfying. Like, yeah, get him. Uh, I mean, Avatar, thoughts? and well, yeah. the first Avatar has a lot of killing in it. Yeah, it does. I, know. I mean, it really does. I mean, like, so it's like, I think, I think this is par for the course. I mean, like I said, James Cameron is this anomaly because he is inherently a schmaltzy guy underneath. I know he's got his reputation for being an asshole and he's going to scream at you until he gets the special effects he wants. But, <laughs> yeah. but like you look at his movies and there is this like level of cheese ball, softy, emotional parts to it, but is also not afraid to have somebody rip somebody's head off. Like Aliens, Terminator 2, True Lie. Like, like you're, he's not going to skimp on the violence. 
Um, I mean, Sh- I think Shannon makes a good point about uh, makes some good points about the Jake and Quaritch fight. Hmm. But overall, for me, I mean, when you are dealing with big action sequences like this, uh, particularly an action sequence that goes on for an entire hour. Yeah. It's really about is everything, in addition to it being awesome and amazing and cool, which I thought it all was, does it all track? Can you tell what's going on? Can you tell where everyone is? And the fact that you had, uh, you know, um, Took, Loak, and Soraya on the boat, and then you had Jake and the Met Kaina truck coming to get them, and then you had Nateri up here, and then you had Korch here, and then you had Spider kind of inside in the cock in the in the main in the main cabin of the boat, and then everybody's moving places from there. And then all of a sudden, like Nateam and Loak are going to save Spider, but then Soraya's like, I'm gonna go with you, and then like it's just like everyone is going all over the place, and the fact that it all really tracks and is clear. Mm-hmm. It like that is a master craftsman at work. That is James Cameron, the storyteller, and James Cameron, the special effects master, and James Cameron, the amazing director, all working hand in hand in hand. Because that last hour is probably the most powerful hour in the movie. Yeah. Um, and it's because it's firing on absolutely all cylinders. I mean, like e- even the fact that he can do something ridiculous, and and I've seen the movie twice, and both times the audience laughs when. It's Took, Loak, and Soraya that are captured by Quaritch in the net. And they all get handcuffed to the rail of the boat. And then Pyakon comes up and then everybody attacks. And then everybody gets freed. Natam comes and frees everybody. And Took goes back down. And Took gets captured right away again. And is like, I can't believe that I just got captured again. Yeah. And and the fact that you throw that line in there shows that you are aware of the fact that you're just repeating your beat. You're doing the same thing, but you've got all these characters and you're like, well, I kind of need somebody for Jake to come rescue. And so I'm going to put her here. But by giving even the line in there, I'm like, oh, God, it happened to me again. You turn to something that is kind of cheesy and stupid into a really funny joke and it works for you. Yeah. So I just think all the and And like I was saying before, it is funny. You look at it and you're like. Well, you did it once on Titanic. You can just do it again with a Navi now. Like, like, well, like, uh, Natiri and Took kind of rushing through the ship as it is on its side and the water is flooding it. You're like, hey, dude, you've done it once before, but I'll be damned if you're not fucking good at it. So you do you. Go to town. It felt a little bit like Poseidon Adventure, too, the original film, not that yeah. side thing. Because where they're going, you know, they're having to figure out how to navigate the ship upside down. I thought that was really well, uh, an element of it that worked really well as well. Uh, but yes, absolutely. And I kept waiting for Victor Garber to show up. I should have built you a better ship. <laughs> My God, the Victor um, Garber Navi. The Victor Garber Navi. That's what I want. The Victor Garber Navi would be awesome. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that would be great to see. For God's sakes. Uh, and of course, we're on the, what, 25th anniversary of Titanic. So that is this year. So a lot of, lot of stuff's coming out. Out, uh, about it as well to kind of coincide with Cameron having this film out as well. Um, oh all right, let's, let's let's wrap up by talking about anything. Well, I mean, you, I think we've kind of hit on the things that we didn't like. Is there anything specific that we've missed that you guys want to talk about, whether we liked or didn't like about the movie that we didn't give enough time to in this in this review? We're at minute, uh, an hour and twenty minutes in. I mean, grieving Zoe Saldana is terrifying. Oh my! God. I mean, the moment that she sees her you know her dead son oh and just the the that just that shriek mm. that she does i mean again it's it's just a, a testament to zoe saldana's yeah. uh, ability as a performer that she's able to do that much without you know w- without us seeing her like it's it's yeah. i mean it's her her emotions it's her voice but it's just so so effective um across the board i thought all the i thought all the cast did a really, really good job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, having watched Avatar and then Avatar right out, uh, Way of the Water right afterwards, her crying for her father and her son, mm-hmm. the, the levels of the emotion that she reaches are chilling. You're absolutely yeah. right, Shannon. You're like, you're like, please stop. It's too real. It's too real, you know? So it's really incredible. Mike, your thoughts on uh, any, uh, anything we missed or any good or bad that you want to discuss about the film here as we're close to wrapping up? Yeah, the two things that I mean that I really enjoyed the most about the film. One is 
the fact that we're having the conversations that we're having. When you got out of the first Avatar film, I loved it, but you didn't hear everybody talking about, oh, I wonder Jake and Natiri, and I wonder what's going to happen. Mm. And the but like like he's really I feel has hooked people in a way with this movie that he didn't before. Oh, like, so what is the deal with Kiri? And, like, what is it she can do? And how is she tied to Awa? And, like, the spider quaritch stuff? And, like, are Loak and Soraya going to do this? And what's going to happen? And is with the Natiri and Spider? And that's going to come to a head. And so he's done a great job of having this bigger cast of characters, but creating this tapestry where we're, like... So, or even to you guys being, like, I think Quaritch is going to pull a Jamie Lannister. I think this is going to happen. Yeah. So... People seem more invested in this story now than they than than a lot a lot of people did after the first movie. And then the other thing is, and you just have to say it, like you know, when 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 you got out of the movie, John, uh, and when and when people when critics started seeing the movie and the reviews started coming out, and people were like, "I've never seen anything like this before on screen." I was blown away. It was overwhelming. Like it was overwhelming to me, but not in a bad way. Like yeah. I, James Cameron is one of the few people that can still deliver newness in a world where we feel like we've seen everything on screen. Yeah. And this movie, despite what you think of the story or James Cameron's writing or some of his dialogue, like you are seeing things in this movie that you have never, ever seen before on film. And that's just, that's, that's awesome to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I said, my, uh, my reaction if it takes him 13 years to cook a meal like this, let the man cook. I got no problem with him taking 13 years because I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Love it much more than the first Avatar. I will absolutely go see this film a couple more times in the theater in different versions that I can to kind of really enjoy what we got here. And I think, you know, if you're going, as Shannon said earlier, if this is what gets people in the cinema, if this is what you have to do to get people in the cinema, then you can't ask for something better than this and this is this is a fantastic film and it takes full advantage of the medium you know babylon with damien Ch Ch chazelle he does interesting things with the medium in that film as well it's a kind of insane in this this is more old school standard stuff that you've seen before but done in such new and incredible vibrant groundbreaking ways that it is fun to explore and for me i didn't get lost in the special effects it was the story that grounded me in the movie. And that what I thought what I thought was missing from the first film was really connecting to the story and the characters. That is here in this film. And I love that. And so the special effects is it just augments that and mm. makes me enjoy it even more as the kind of tapestry of the canvas that you're getting these stories put on top of, which I think works so well overall. Oh, um, you guys are score horse. What do you think of the score? Did you like the score? Did you love the score? What are your feelings on the score? made me sad i miss james i mean it's a great score okay it's a great score but it was a great score because he they did such a good job of evoking james horner mm -hmm. that it made me sad and i was missing james horner like it wasn't like i was missing him because like oh they did a garbage score it's beautiful i've been listening to it in the car there are some just absolutely gorgeous tracks but there are just some of those flares that horner was really just well known for are there and present yeah uh and i was like oh sad yeah, yeah Simon I think Franklin being the score, Simon Franklin, the composer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do think James James Horner's absence is is is, no, is noto noticeable. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that there was anything there was nothing wrong with the score. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just knowing what he was able to do across the board with not just the first Avatar, but you know, with everything that he scored. Yeah. Um, knowing what he could have done. It's it's mm -hmm. it's very sad. It's very unfortunate. It's a fair point. Uh, let's hit the let's hit these. Um, oh, yeah, I love the score. I, I enjoyed the score, and especially when we hit the drum beats and the action and all that stuff. Really took the um, film to the next level, and the smaller moments, the quieter moments, I yeah. thought were really uh, well done and well composed for those music cues. There, uh, Jad Lawland uh, here. Lawan says, "Where do you guys rank the Way of Water OG James Cameron sequels? Aliens is number one." Where do you put Way of Water? Uh, I don't know if I'd say Aliens is number one. Ooh, damn. <laughs> I have a, I have a soft spot for T two. You do, having you played do. John Connor in Terminator Two 3D for a very very long time. Um, right now I think it's probably number three for me. It's T okay. two Aliens, The Way of Water. Um, Shannon is as always slightly off. Um. <laughs> I love I love Way of Water, but you can't argue. Aliens and T two are two of the all time 
greatest sequels ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it does go Aliens, Terminator 2, and Way of Water. Okay. For me, it's uh, Aliens, Way of Water, and T2. I just oh. do not, I cannot stand Edward Furlong, and I hate rewatching that movie. Can we do a Edward Furlong uh, removed from that movie? I'd like to see that movie and see. No, you oh, can't. My, my. <laughs> That's also why I like Terminator Dark Fate. All right, Brandon uh, says, um, hey, with two more Avatar films, what do you think the future plots will be? Are we looking at a Pandora Civil War, an all-out of invasion from Earth people since the planet is dying? And Also, I would love to see JC make a space film similar to Interstellar. Yeah, good point here. We, we didn't touch on that. Edie Falco's character, the general there, alluding to the fact that Earth is dying. They are desperate to... Uh, pop- uh, colonize a new planet in essence terraforming Pandora like we saw in Man of Steel to be their planet Earth's planet so what are your feelings about that kind of laying that little bit of again again a seed that we are going to see blossom in the next movie into something pretty terrible so what do you guys anticipate the future plots will hold do we see a Pandora Civil War where some people side with the humans over their fellow Navi, as we saw in the third Planet of the Apes movie recently? I mean, I, I believe Cameron did say in an interview that if they get to number five, that it will go off of Pandora. Like, you mm. will see the current state. Is that not a... They, is that not they, a? They, they, they did say that, and they have since said the opposite. Retracted so who it? knows? Yeah. Yeah, they said that that was originally part of the plan, is that we right. would go back and see an Earth and see what had happened to it. Or, like, there was ideas about Natiri or some of the uh, Navi going to Earth. But then they recently came out in an interview and said, as they've been, like, kind of fleshing it out, James Cameron said that um, in the same way that you could travel Earth for your entire life and not see all the wonders that are on our planet, Pandora is the same way, so why would we ever leave? Oh. So I think that uh, now look, they might change their mind again. It just depends where the story goes. But uh, but I do think regardless of whether we go to Earth or go off of Pandora, um, yes, I think that what we're looking at here is a bigger picture of colonization on a planetary scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. One more thing. Well, no, and I, and I was going to say, I mean, you know, obviously we're, we're probably going to meet more Navi the more that Pandora yeah. is explored. And maybe there is a situation where there is some sort of infighting. Like, I don't know if they would necessarily oh, yeah. team up with the humans, but if they're, but if you have this many tribes, chances are they don't all get along. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would be curious to see that. It- well, look, I mean, in the same way, I mean, you can, again, James Cameron is clearly pulling from history and pulling from different indigenous cultures, mm-hmm. but uh, yes, they're probably, in the big world of Pandora, there probably are some Navi tribes that will be more than happy to take what the humans have to give them yeah. and betray other Navi. There are probably humans on Earth that would be horrified to find out what's happening on Pandora and would want to help the Navi. So I do think kind of to John's yeah. point about human bad Navi good, I think the fact that Spider is a character, that Kiri is a character who is tied to a human, that all of the Jake's, all of Sully's children are seen as sort of freaks and demons because they have that blood yeah. of, uh, you know, Jake Sully as our hero is that hero of two worlds. It is Dances with Wolves. It is that story. But I think if he can take some of those tropes that he has started from and kind of weave this story of like, well, where do you go? Like, yeah. if humanity really is fucked because we finally did it, what it looks like we're on the road to doing anyway, yeah. and we depleted all of our resources and fucked Earth up, and all of humanity is going to die um, unless they do something, and then you have Pandora, which is the perfect home for us, and then you have all the Navi who are the indigenous people to live there, yeah. you know, it might he might just default to, let's just get rid of humans and you're ruining the Earth, but, or you're ruining Pandora the same way you were in Earth, but maybe his bigger plan is to show us some other way and whatever that is that james cameron thinks it is we'll see what it is that's for sure one last super chat here from uh, jad lowen if this movie underperforms with box with the box o- at the box office is a trilogy good enough for fans and james cameron yeah i looked it up real quick as i saw this super chat right now it is sitting at five just about just under 500 million worldwide at 497 million and some change here uh, but it's only been out like a week and a half. So um, what do you guys, th- or not even le- less than that, I think. So what do you guys think would, do you think, James, if it underperforms in a post-COVID world, though, do you think that the studio would uh, stop him I, at three? 
I don't think anybody can really stop James Cameron. But uh, <laughs> they, they did say that if the if the second and third movie do underperform, they won't do a fourth and fifth. And look, if they if we get three really cool, if if the next Avatar movie is on par with this movie, and that is the end of that trilogy, and we never get to know what the fourth and fifth movie are, I think that'll be fine. I don't think that's going to happen though. I think that again. Never bet against James Cameron. I was looking it up and I was reading some articles today and I think yeah. when the first Avatar movie came out, its opening weekend box office was something like 77 million. Yeah, that's what it was. And it was kind of seen as that it underperformed and people right. were like, oh, well, it was James Cameron's big bet. Did people didn't want to see blue people? And then the movie went on to make over $2 billion. Uh, and I think that the Avatar movies are not the movies that... You you it's this is different than uh, the the latest Marvel or DC where you see that box office and it's because James Cameron movies don't have the drop off after the first week. Right, right. Titanic went on and was number one for like three years or something. Yeah, like it just was like number one forever. Um, and then Avatar, you know, it didn't. It, if Avatar had performed like a Marvel movie after a seventy-seven million opening weekend, it would have dropped to like forty. Yeah, and that's not what happened. Right. So I don't think uh, with the holidays coming up, with nothing else huge really coming out for the holiday season, um, I have a feeling we're just going to see Avatar just kind of just, just keep on going. And ironically, this is Cameron's first hundred million dollar opening weekend ever in for any yeah. of his movies. So. Uh, Shannon, your thoughts on this real quick? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they've they said that they have an ending envisioned for the third film. Yeah. And, you know, if 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 it underperforms. But, you know, as you all were saying, like the the uh, box office is not going to be front loaded yeah. like it is. Or at least that's what that's what the analysts are saying that. Um, and, and also because you do want to see it in that IMAX in you know, you, you want to see it in the highest highest caliber theater that you can and like it is it's book solid like you can't get yep. an imax ticket right now to I believe, avatar I, I i probably don't have this number exactly right either but i was reading it uh you know most times when a movie comes out in regular format and imax format imax doesn't account for a huge chunk of its box office it's just a part of its box office right. but with the opening weekend of avatar it was something like 60 percent uh, was IMAX screenings. Yeah. Wow. And like to your point, there's fewer IMAX screens, so they're selling out. So it also, that's what analysts were saying, is it's looking like the movie's going to keep going because people are trying to go see it in 3D IMAX, mm -hmm. and those theaters are selling out, so people are waiting to see it this upcoming weekend or the yeah. following weekend or New Year's. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see over the holidays, but I think, it's, I think we're just going to see it do exactly what James Cameron movies do. Yeah. It, 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 the legs. The legs of that film... And certainly, as you said, Mike, through the because there's nothing really coming until we get to yeah. Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, uh, near the midway point of February, February 17th, I think. So it's got a long time to rain at the box office for sure. Uh, Navi right, legs, be... Navi legs are very long <laughs> and strong for sure, and strong and, and uh, mighty, mighty. All right, thank you all so much for watching this uh, spoiler review here of Avatar: Way of the Water with the Geek Boys. We appreciate it madly, uh, and thank you for the stream labs and the super chats. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter, it's at Geek underscore Buddies on Instagram at the underscore Geek underscore Buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca says Mikey. Um, if you like friendships with telepathic whales and uh, humans being the bad guys, then this is the place for you. Uh, we love talking about this stuff, and here's what you guys can help uh, us do to keep talking about it. Hit that like button below. Subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Check out all the amazing content he's got there. Leave your comments below on the YouTube page. Uh, let us know what you thought of this movie. What do you think is coming up next? What was your favorite part? What was your least favorite part? Did the frame rate mess you up? Did you love it? Let us know all your thoughts below. If you are listening to us on a podcast, go ahead and leave us some stars and some comments. It helps us go up in the rankings so that more people can find us. And as always, the best thing that you can do is retweet this video, post it on your socials, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. Absolutely. We see you, ladies and gentlemen. And you know what else you should see? Carbon Health. CarbonHealth.com. Go and get checked out today for all your healthcare <laughs> questions, concerns, and needs. Head on over there. they got virtual care, in-person care, and look. We're hearing those rates, those COVID rates starting to skyrocket in certain locations. So 
go get tested. They've got testing kits. They test you there uh, in person at their facilities. So make sure you check them out and see if one is close to you. If not, download the app to have a dock in your pocket in case anything happens on the road during the holidays and you need to get checked out as soon as possible carbonhealth.com all right thank you all so much and uh look for our other content coming up later on this week we've got a a double episode willow review coming and our main show coming tomorrow for those of you who are watching us tonight live we will be back with our main show tomorrow and then the willow review after that and we'll let you know what we're going to be doing for uh next week there as we head into the new year for sure all right take care of yourselves be well we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode of the oh geek sorry (laughs) buddies i was reading the chat i was reading the chat sorry